to our studies in the book of Acts, and we come to the 19th chapter, and we're reading the first 22 verses of Acts chapter 19. So let us hear the word of God, Acts chapter 19. While Apollos, now we heard about him last time in the end of chapter 18, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. There he is, the chap I mentioned to the children. The tyrant. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Some of the Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Some, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. Amen, and God will bless to us this reading from his word. Now, those of you who are new to St. George's Tron <clears throat> or new to the Christian faith need to know that the book of Acts is Luke's second volume concerned with the growth and spread of the Christian church following the death and resurrection of Jesus. The church, which numbered only about 120 or so when Jesus died, grew to over 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. That's in chapter 2 of the book. And then to over 5,000 just a few days later, chapter 4 of this book. And we've seen 
over the past months, mainly through persecution, how the church spread from Jerusalem through Judea and Samaria and then on to the ends of the known world. We've seen how Samaritans, who were half-Jews, and Gentiles, who were non-Jews, were converted and were added to the church. We've seen how in the first half of the book, Peter, the fisherman disciple of Jesus, is the focus of Luke's attention. And in the second half, we're seeing that it's Saul who became Paul who is now the focus of attention. We've seen how Jerusalem remained the headquarters of the early church, but how Antioch became the center of missionary outreach. And throughout the book, we've seen how the risen, ascended Lord was building his church, just as he promised he would. Against all odds, it seems, the church was growing in numbers and penetrating into areas of the known world that we would have least expected. Luke's account in the second half centers around a number of missionary journeys undertaken by Paul and his companions. The first one, in chapters 13 and 14, began with a tour of Cyprus before they crossed over to Pamphylia and then north to Pisidia. The second journey, chapters 16 to 18, began with Paul and Silas revisiting those churches in Pisidia, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, and then with them being directed northwest to Troas, and then over to Philippi, to what is now Europe. And after planting a church in Philippi, the missionaries went on to Thessalonica and Berea, and then Paul went off to Athens and then to Corinth. And in our last study, before Christmas, we followed Paul as he left Corinth, called him briefly at Ephesus, before heading to Jerusalem and then back to Antioch, where he spent some time with his prayer partners. Then he began his third missionary journey, revisiting those churches in Pisidia and Phrygia again, before heading due west to Ephesus. And that's where we take up the story this morning. It's becoming clear, isn't it, that Paul is developing a deliberate policy of moving purposefully from one strategic city center to another. Athens in chapter 17, Corinth in chapter 18, now Ephesus in chapter 19. And did you notice in verse 21, he mentions that he wants to visit Rome. Athens may not have had a big population, but Athens was the intellectual center of the ancient world. The place where the great philosophers Socrates, Plato, Aristotle had expounded their philosophies. Corinth was the great commercial center, commanded trade routes in all directions. It had two ports. It was well known for its pride and immorality. Ephesus was also noted as a, for its commerce, but it was the principal religious center of the Greek or Roman world. And these were the strategic cities which Paul was targeting with the good news of the Lord Jesus. On this first Sunday of a new year, it's good for us to pause for a minute and reflect on two things. First is this. Since the year 2000, more people live in cities than in rural communities. For the first time in history, more people live in cities. And there are some massive cities in our world, you know. There are some 80 cities with a population of over 4 million. 
There are some 20 cities with a population of over 10 million. We have friends here from Jakarta, one of those cities. Huge cities. People living in cities nowadays. And the second thing to reflect on is what a strategic position we have here in the city center of the largest city in Scotland. We need to think of these things at the beginning of a new year. Surely, surely there must be lessons that we can learn from Paul in this area of taking the gospel to the center of our cities. Well, here's Paul in Ephesus. Ephesus was a city of 500 million people, 500,000 people, half a million, just a bit, a bit smaller than Glasgow, but the center of this whole province of Asia. What did Paul do? What did Paul do in Ephesus? Well, there are three things that I want you to notice from this first half of the 19th chapter. First of all, Paul spent time with one group of people sorting out the basics of what it means to be a Christian. We know from the previous chapter, 18, that Paul had visited Ephesus on his way to Jerusalem. And he promised to come back if it was God's will. Having left his friends, Priscilla and Aquila, there in Ephesus, it's reasonable to assume that they would be amongst the first people he visited when he returned. He maybe even stayed with them. They would tell him about Apollos, who'd gone to Corinth. And they'd also tell him about this group of about 12 men, disciples, they're called, about whom they were concerned. So Paul met these men. And you notice in those opening verses, he asked them, had they received the Holy Spirit when they believed? And they answered that they hadn't, and they hadn't even heard about the Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them about their baptism. What baptism had they received? And they replied, John's baptism. And then Paul explained to them that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance in anticipation of the one coming after him, namely Jesus. And when they heard this, and when they had it explained to them, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Now, what are we to make of that? Well, first of all, we can say this. Paul had time for this small group. It was a difficult group. They could easily have been written off as being heretical or as being hopelessly defective. But Paul spoke to them. Paul questioned them. Paul loved them. Paul taught them. And Paul brought them into a full experience of the Christian life. You see, it seems that these men were disciples of John the Baptist. I wonder, actually, if they had received their teaching from Apollos, since he was just mentioned a few verses before. But by questioning them, as he does, Paul makes the point that believing, having faith, is linked with receiving the Holy Spirit and with baptism. Those who have believed have received the Holy Spirit. Those who have been baptized have received the Spirit. You cannot separate the sign, water, from the thing signified, the Spirit. Now the fact that they had not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit to use their words, cannot mean that they'd never heard of the Spirit at all. He's referred to many times in the Old Testament, and John the Baptist spoke 
of the Messiah as baptizing the people with the Spirit. It must mean that they had not heard whether John's prophecy had been fulfilled. It must mean that they hadn't heard about Pentecost. The fact that they'd only received John's baptism, not Christian baptism, meant that they were still looking forward to the Christ, not understanding that Jesus was the Christ, not understanding that the new age had been ushered in in Jesus. They had repented, they had turned from the old life, and they were seeking to live for God. But they weren't believing into Jesus. They hadn't been baptized into Jesus. They hadn't received the blessing of the new age, the indwelling spirit. Once they understood what Paul was saying about Jesus, they put their trust in him, in Jesus. They were baptized into Jesus and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Paul was making sure that the believers there in Ephesus were clear about what was involved in becoming a Christian. It involved four things. One, repentance. Two, faith in Jesus. Three, water baptism. Four, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's clear from the rest of the Acts of the Apostles that that's always the case. The order may vary a little, but these four things belong together and are essential to anyone becoming a Christian. Repentance, faith in Jesus, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The laying on of the apostles' hands, together with the tongue speaking and prophesying, was special to Ephesus, as they had been to Samaria in chapter 8. And that was in order to demonstrate, visibly and publicly, that these particular groups were incorporated into Christ by the Spirit. There are no Samaritans. There are no disciples of John the Baptist left in the world today. Now, I think it's important. I think there's an important lesson for us here. Are we, all of us, are we clear about what's involved in being a Christian? We get a lot of people coming to this church from other churches. We get a lot of students coming to us when they come to university. And it's so easy for us to do one of two things. To assume that all of them are Christians. Or to think that they're hopelessly defective in their beliefs and to write them off. And we and they must be very clear what it means to be a Christian today. It means repentance, turning from self and from sin to God. It means faith in Jesus. It means baptism in water, whether that's as an infant or as an adult. It means receiving the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Helper, the one who enables us to live the Christian life. It does not necessarily involve the laying on of hands or speaking in tongues and prophesying. Now it strikes me that there are many people in the Church of Scotland certainly up north in the Church of Scotland. But I also think 
in St. George's Tron, there are many people who know a lot about Jesus, who may well have been baptized as infants or even as adults, who may well have repented in that they've turned away from the world and are trying to live for God, but who have not yet believed into Jesus and received the Holy Spirit. I know that because you ask them if they're a Christian and they'll say, well, I hope so, or yeah, I think I am. Or you ask them, why should God let you into his heaven when you die? And they say, because I'm better than so-and-so. I'm trying my best, Mr. Rushton. I've done this, that, and the other, you know. That's not the right answer. I'd be very surprised if there weren't several people in this church this morning like that. You've been coming to St. George's Tron for years, perhaps. Everyone assumes you're a Christian. You even assume it yourself. But are you? Are you trusting into Jesus? What better day than today, the first Sunday of a new year? What better day than today to sort this out once and for all? Tell the Lord how you're feeling. Tell him that you want to make a new start. Tell him that you want to... Stop trying and start trusting. And start trusting him. That's the first thing Paul did, was to make sure that they were clear about what it meant to be a Christian, about the basics. The second thing that Paul did, and this is really the main thing that he did in Ephesus, was to teach the Bible. As was his custom, he began by going to the synagogue. Well, he was a trained rabbi after all. He'd be welcomed into synagogues and he'd be invited to speak. Actually, in Ephesus, he he did that for three months, which was considerably longer than in most of the places he visited. He spoke boldly, we're told, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Now, those are words that we've noted several times about Paul's presentation. Arguing and persuading. He didn't just speak about Jesus and the kingdom. He sought to convince his hearers about the truth and about the relevance of what he was saying to argue from the Old Testament scriptures about the kingdom is the same as to argue that Jesus is the Christ. Since it's Jesus, the Christ, who inaugurated the kingdom. Well, that's what he did. But as usual, some of those in the synagogue became obstinate. Verse 9. They refused to believe and publicly malign the way. The way, which is a name for Christianity that occurs several times in the Acts. It's interesting, isn't it? The way. It's interesting that most of the world's religions use the imagery of the way or the path. Very interesting that several times in the Bible we're confronted with two ways to choose from. In our psalm reading this morning, Psalm 1, we had the two ways. And in our Bible reading tonight, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, we have these two ways again. Well, as a direct result of this opposition in the synagogue, Paul left them. Just as he'd done in Corinth. Remember in Corinth, 
He'd gone next door to the house of Titius Justus and had his meetings there. Here in Ephesus, he went to the lecture hall of the tyrant himself. And he held daily discussions there. One of the ancient uh, texts of Acts, I wasn't making it up when I said to the children, one of the ancient texts in, of Acts says that Paul lectured there, this is the quote, from the fifth hour to the tenth. That is, from 11 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. According to the experts, public life began at sunrise, continued in the cool of the morning till 11 o'clock. At 11 o'clock, the city stopped, not just for 11 but for this prolonged siesta, resuming work again at about 4 p.m. But Paul didn't rest. He used Tyrannus' hall for these daily discussions come lectures. Now, assuming, assuming he kept one day in seven for worship and rest, five hours of lectures, six days a week, for two years, that's how long he stayed there, that would add up to 3,120 hours of arguments and discussions. That's a long time, isn't it? No wonder Luke adds in verse 10, all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. You see, all the roads of Asia converged on Ephesus. All the inhabitants of Asia visited Ephesus from time to time to buy or sell, to visit relatives, to frequent the baths, to attend the games in the stadium, to watch a drama in the theater, to worship the goddess. And while they were there in Ephesus, they would hear of this lecturer called Paul, who was speaking and answering questions for five hours in the middle of every day. Evidently, many of them dropped in, listened, and were converted. They returned home to their towns and villages as Christians and saw the gospel spread down the valley to Colossae, Laodicea, Hierapolis, and perhaps to the remaining five of those seven churches in Revelations 2 and 3, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia. Amazing. What did Paul teach? Well, I guess he began where he left off in the synagogue with the Old Testament scriptures and how they were fulfilled in Jesus. I expect he went on to explain about Jesus, his coming, his life, death, and resurrection. I guess he expounded what he would soon be writing in his letters. Perhaps the letter to the Ephesians was a summary of of what he'd been teaching over those two years. Theology, worship, practical Christianity. See, Paul taught the Bible, the Old Testament, and what he was going to be writing as part of the New Testament. Five hours, six days a week, two years. That's a lot of teaching. That's what Paul did. Now, surely there are lessons for us here, aren't there? See, Paul didn't organize short, sharp evangelistic events or campaigns. He simply taught, lectured, answered questions every day. And people came, and people were converted, and the word spread. Paul didn't spend his time visiting the believers. He held these daily discussions. So what he says in chapter 20, verse 34, about his hands supplying his needs, he may well have been doing his tent making as well. And just think of the believers in Ephesus. They were eager to be taught. They too were willing to give up their siesta time, 
in order to be taught the Word of God? I suppose our Wednesday 30-minute service is the equivalent to this, is it? Certainly thrilling to see people coming in to that Wednesday service, people who've never been into a church building before or not for a long time, and they come in here and they hear the Bible explained. Or our Thursday lunchtime Christianity Explored course for people who want to ask their questions about the Christian faith. What about this? What if we suggested having classes daily, not just for outsiders? I wonder how keen we would be to give up our lunch times to discuss the Bible. Do we really want to learn from the Word of God? Or do we think that we're mature enough, thank you. Second thing Paul did was to teach the Bible. And the third thing Paul did in Ephesus was to see God at work. That's brought out for us in verse 11. Notice it doesn't say Paul did extraordinary miracles. It says God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Not just miracles, demonstrations of God's power, but extraordinary, special, remarkable miracles. And Luke goes on to mention three specific things. Verse 12, there's these handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched Paul, which were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. Then in verses 13 to 16, there were these seven sons of Sceva who were trying to invoke the name of Jesus over those who were demon-possessed but were themselves overpowered by a demon-possessed man and beaten up. And in verses 17 to 19, there's this bonfire of all the scrolls and paraphernalia, those who practice sorcery. Notice, valued at 50,000 drachmas. Well, what's that? I'll tell you what that is. That's the equivalent to the daily wage of 50,000 people. That was some bonfire. Now, none, none of this was Paul's doing. He couldn't cure diseases. He couldn't drive out people. He couldn't persuade people to burn their magic charms. This was the Lord himself at work. What was the Lord doing? I'll tell you what he was doing. He was, first of all, encouraging Paul. Do you remember in Corinth when Paul was afraid and thinking of giving up, the Lord spoke to him in a vision and told him to keep on speaking because he was with him and he had many people in that city. Well, here in Ephesus, the Lord doesn't give him another vision, but the Lord performed these extraordinary miracles through him. What an encouragement that must have been for Paul to see God at work like that. Secondly, the Lord was vindicating what Paul was teaching. He was showing that Jesus was the Christ. He was showing that the kingdom had come. And thirdly, the Lord was building his church. Look what Luke says in verse 20. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. That's another way of saying that the church spread, that many were coming to saving faith. The third thing that Paul did was to see the Lord at work. What's the lesson for us there? Well, simply this. We need to remember that the Lord is at work. And we have to remember we must leave the final convincing of people to him. We can't perform miracles. But we're not told to. We can't change people, but we're not told to. We can't persuade people to give up their old ways. We aren't told to, but the Lord can. And the Lord will 
do these things. If it needs a miracle or two to convince people, then the Lord can do that. He alone can and will make sure his word spreads widely and grows in power. Well, it's the beginning of a new year. What, what do we want for Glasgow in 2002? We want more and more people to hear the word of the Lord, don't we? What do we want for St. George's Tron in 2002? We want the word of the Lord to spread and grow in power, don't we? What must we do then? Well, according to Paul here, we must be clear about what it means to be a Christian. We must be trusting into Christ instead of trying to be good. Secondly, we, we must be devoted to the teaching of the Bible. We must be giving our time to learning together what God is saying to us. And we must be looking to the Lord to confirm his word in people's lives. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do want to see more people in Glasgow hearing your word. We do want our church to be growing as you add to our numbers those who are being saved. Lord, help us, all of us, to be clear about what it means to be a Christian. Help us, all of us, to be trusting into Jesus. Help all of us to be devoted to the teaching of the Bible. And help all of us to be looking to you to confirm your word in people's lives. So take us, Lord, and use us through this coming year in the building of your church. We pray in Jesus, our Savior's name.